Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Corporate Citizenship Watch, a webcast series offering practical insights and tools for companies, investors, and nonprofits to meet the changing expectations for the role that business plays in society. I'm Jeff Hoffman, Corporate Citizenship and Philanthropy Institute leader, part of the ESG Center here at the Conference Board. The Conference Board is the world's leading independent nonprofit think tank devoted to serving business and society for over 100 years. The ESG Center, our mission is to help guide uh, the evolving role of the corporation in society. As such, we're committed to serving not only our members, but also society at large. So that's why today's webcast is available to the public and why we're making a wealth of resources available to you um, addressing issues such as economic health and the social crisis. And it's all open to the public at our website, www.conference-board.org hyphen, or COVID hyphen 19. So follow that um, on the screen and you'll get all sorts of, of good information. So we are on a journey and um, we have been on this journey now for quite a few months. Um, and here in corporate citizenship, we continue to work on to work on efforts to help shape and navigate the new normals. A global pandemic followed by an economic downturn that has created a humanitarian crisis has altered how we are approaching our work. Add to that the reckoning with social justice issues and those issues of inequality and equity that are fundamentally altering the way companies interact with society. We have been working for years to correct the societal impact measurement nut. The conference board started working with the Impact Genome Project two years ago to tackle part of this. That is the cost of desired outcomes through our work with various nonprofits. We issued our first report titled Toward Standardized Societal Outcomes for Companies in 2019. Many of you participated in that research. And over the next month, we will be launching resources for companies to help them more, be more effective in their corporate citizenship work under the banner of optimizing societal impact, which will include the next edition of our report. Our monthly corporate citizenship update newsletter will provide information once live. So feel free to subscribe to that. Today, we will give you a preview of some of those resources, or one of those resources, and that is the Price of Impact Index. I'm delighted to uh, be joined by four experts um, in the field. They are Andrew Dunkelman, who is the head of Impact and Insights at Google.org. Arlene Isaacs-Lowe, who is the Global Head of Corporate Social Responsibility for Moody's Corporation and President of the Moody's Foundation. Nancy Rogers, who is Senior Vice President, Corporate Social Responsibility and Sustainability for the Lincoln Financial Group and President of the Lincoln Financial Foundation. Um, and Jason Saul, who is Chief Executive Officer of Mission Measurement. So before we begin, um, I have a few housekeeping notes to cover. First, we are offering CPE credit for participating in today's live program. Um, just a note that if you are trying to apply for it right now, uh, <clears throat> the conference board uh, website is down for short maintenance, so you can actually follow the information in the chat box with an email to apply for it because we want to make sure that uh, you get <clears throat> what you need. Um, so uh, that 
uh, I think covers it for the CPE credit. There will be pop-ups uh, that come up um, three times during the session. You need to make sure that you click OK. Um, each time it comes up, you know, that proves that you are actually sitting there and watching the webcast today so you can get your credit. Um, second, I want to underscore that we welcome audience participation in today's session. You can ask questions at any time by entering them in the chat box at the bottom left of your screen. We will work them into the conversation as time permits and respond to any in answered questions via email after the webcast. Finally, a few other notes. You can download additional background materials and the slides for today um, in the download section at the bottom of your screen. You can enlarge the video to full screen view by clicking on the four arrows on the upper right hand corner of your screen. You can share this program with your colleagues after the fact as it will be viewable on demand. And please complete the evaluation at the end of today's session. It will take only a couple of minutes, but it will allow us to incorporate your feedback into future webcasts. And finally, for you uh, to have the best possible experience, it would be best to close any other apps that you are currently using on your computer. This will minimize connectivity and bandwidth issues. If you still experience audio and video issues, please close this application and join again. All right, now let's get started. As many of you watching can attest, Available resources are tight, yet we are often asked to do more. We seek to optimize our impact, and today's discussion is intended to spark ideas on how we can utilize metrics and benchmarking to make better decisions. I have talked that we are on a journey together, and these three companies represented on the panel uh, today have been part of that journey. Before we their story and ideas, Jason is going to tell us about the new Price of Impact Index. So Jason, take it away. Thanks, Jeff, and it's indeed a journey. Um, what I'm going to share with you today is part of a journey, right? It's by no means perfect, but uh, we are learning as we go. And I think one of the things that's most fundamental for us to, um, to appreciate in all this is that we are spending an historic amount of money on uh, social change and on nonprofits right now. Uh, the government is spending well into the trillions of dollars. Corporate social responsibility is spending between 30 and 60 billion dollars a year. It's an enormous amount of money and invariably we're going to ask the question, uh, what works? What's the best bang for the buck? Which programs will deliver the outcomes we care about? For so long, these questions have uh, eluded us. Uh, there's been almost a kind of a, an impossible overhang of doubt that we'll never be able to benchmark nonprofits. We can benchmark their finances, but we certainly can never be able to compare um, one to the other. These questions were raised by everybody from the World Bank to the Gates Foundation to many others. Um, however, the concept of um, the concept of benchmarking and the concept of comparison is, uh, is something that we've long desired. Um, Certainly the overhead myth that plagues the nonprofit sector is only uh, present because we don't have a way to be able to compare based on our bottom line or our outcomes as opposed to our overhead or our financial measures. Uh, as, as one expert said in a, social, a Stanford Social Innovation Review article, it's, it's easier to compare our financial metrics than our bottom line metrics, but ultimately until we can figure out outcomes, we're going to be stuck with financial measures which means we're going to be stuck with the overhead myth. One of the big ahas that we've had in our research through the years, working with many of you as corporate social responsibility leaders as well as others in the philanthropy field, is that all of us use different language, but many of us are describing the same outcomes. So these are actual stated goals from different uh, uh, societal or nonprofit programs um, of things that they're doing and things they're trying to accomplish. But when you translate all those into a common language, you realize that whether it's an internship or a math competition or a science fair, all of them are aiming at the same outcome of trying to um, 
uh, trying to achieve a common outcome. Um, can everyone hear me okay, by the way? Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. good. Um, outcomes not only can be standardized, but we can benchmark outcomes. Um, what that means is we can look at the cost per outcome of one program compared to the cost per outcome of another program now that the per outcome part has been standardized. So by looking at the efficacy rate, meaning how many people are getting a positive outcome times the number of people reached divided by the budget, we can understand what a program's cost per outcome is. And then we can start to benchmark or compare various programs that are trying to achieve the same goal. Um, an example here is from uh, a charity led by Kimball Musk, Elon's brother actually, that's called the Kitchen Community. Um, they have an 81% efficacy rate as they themselves have self-determined based on some surveys they've done. And they reach 95,000 some odd people. So we know the total number of outcomes they're achieving is about 77,000. And when we divide that into their budget, we know that their cost per outcome is about $18. That's not the cost per person reached, it's the cost per person impacted, meaning the number of people who get an outcome. From these data points of individual nonprofits tracking their cost per outcome, we've accumulated all this information together and put it into an index. Um, if you imagine one, two, five, twenty, a hundred, a thousand nonprofits reporting against the same outcomes, we can eventually see benchmarks, meaning what is the cost per outcome on average to achieve this outcome or this particular result. And you can also see there's a range, right? So there are some organizations that are going to skew higher and some that are going to skew lower. There's all kinds of explanations for why one organization's cost per outcome may be different. It could be that they're operating in a different context and trying to reach really hard to reach audiences. Another organization could have um, a much more efficient way of reaching people using technology or being able to um, leverage volunteers. Um, but this prompts us to ask questions and it allows us a single basis of comparison that we've always dreamed of having for the nonprofit sector, which is how do we compare one charity to another other than their overhead? More information can be found about the Price of Impact Index um, through the conference board and we'll be sharing it with you uh, shortly. Finally, the questions that um, are coming up about how do we use benchmarks are ones that we should all think through carefully because data is not very useful unless we figure out how to apply it. Um, you'll hear today from how grantmakers are using data in their decision making, benchmarks and other things. But now that we have a, a meaningful point of comparison among different types of programs, we can do things like have better due diligence. So instead of just looking at the financials of a nonprofit, we can also look at how they perform on a standard basis and allow us to understand um, not only what their cost per outcome is, but what their needs are, right? So we can size the grant appropriately. If we're giving away $10,000 and we know that the cost per outcome is $1,000, we can set our expectations that we're only going to get 10 people impacted, which is what is appropriate for the cost of the work to be done. We can also compare various alternatives uh, to see if we give it to grant, grantee A versus grantee B, what the return on investment will be. And finally, we can look at outliers to identify innovation. For the nonprofits, this is really about solving, finally, the overhead myth and allowing nonprofits to first and foremost communicate the true cost of their work. It's not just about what's the, the, the smallest donation that you can give them or how can they get their cost down, but it's what it costs them to produce an outcome or a unit of social change and their ability to communicate that breathes new life into fundraising for nonprofits. So it's not just about randomly asking for dollars. It's like, if I want to have this impact, here's what it's really going to cost. It also allows nonprofits to justify potentially a more innovative or expensive theory of change um, by explaining why that's going to cost more, because we're trying to reach harder audiences or we're testing new approaches. Nonprofits can also identify innovation through benchmarking to see how their peers are doing things at a lower cost or a higher level of effectiveness. And finally, the ability to simplify measurement and reporting. All of these new capabilities are possible with the simple innovation of having benchmarks around our impact. Now I'm going to turn it over to the 
to the rest of the panel to hear about how they're using data to improve their strategy and decision making. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Jason. Yeah, I think this is, is fascinating. And when I look back um, on my career, I just think, you know, many, many of you who are watching today are probably working on your FY uh, 2021 plans and, and budgets. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, besides having a specific, you know, dollar or euro amount that we're looking at, we also might have goals of we want to positively affect 100 children's lives in a particular community. Well, I think this is a great tool to help us in that budgeting process to really figure out ahead of time instead of putting, you know, a specific financial amount towards that, we can actually back that up by what is the cost to achieve what we need to achieve, uh, you know, right out of the chute. So very, very, very exciting. And uh, we look forward to seeing this live. Um, but let's, let's talk about, we talked about the, uh, we're on a, on a journey and, and each of you have have been on this. And Arlene, I want to start with you because you have been with us um, on this journey from the conference board perspective from the very start. Um, and what have you experienced as far as uh, benchmarking and the Impact Genome Project and how this is helping you manage your role and helping your business overall? Okay, we are not hearing you, Arlene. You are. We can hear, can you, hear you now. now. Perfect. <laughs> Great. <laughs> We're all becoming uh, technology experts yes, in this are. new reality. Um, so uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, for the introduction and thank you to the conference board for um, allowing me to be part of this, this discussion. It is one that I am particularly interested in and uh, passionate about. But in the context of the journey for Moody's Corporation um, and the role that Impact Genome plays, um, I would say that um, about in 2017, uh, we looked at really re-engineering our corporate social responsibility strategy. And that was really informed by some observations I had had while running our business in Europe and um, the evidence that there was strong transitioning from a focus on shareholder priorities to broader stakeholder priorities and how that would really inform long-term value for an enterprise. And at the same time, you had the evolution of asset managers who were also looking into this more broadly, um, I think highlighted by the, the infamous Larry Fink letter at the end of 2017. Um, so in the context of that, when we looked at the re-engineering of our strategy, um, and in light of the fact that we were really building out our own capacity in the context of ESG assessments and evaluation, it became incredibly um, important that this was incorporated into the overarching strategy of the company. And so we went through a process of really thinking about um, what, what it is we did well in the world what would we be able to make a substantive impact on from a societal perspective? And how did we interconnect that with, one, our growing global footprint, as well as, um, um, you know, what our employees cared about? And so we underwent this sort of strategic um, evaluation and came up with our three pillars, which are around um, economic empowerment for small and growing businesses, activating a sustainable environment, and helping young people reach our passions. That's our three pillars, and that, that's how we thought we best aligned in the context of what we do in the world and what we, we uh, can have impact on. But as we were uh, going through sort of the process and candidly around the aspect of me advocating for additional resources for execution, 
um, we also looked at how do we really have a more disciplined and standardized approach to measure um, the effect of the investments we were making from a social perspective and looked around at that time for what were actually the, um, the potential frameworks or platforms that we could utilize um, because in light, light of sort of what we do, which is um, heavily reliant on data analysis and um, assessments, we wanted to apply that same discipline to our corporate social responsibility um, framework. And so um, we found uh, Impact Genome Project um, with Mission Measurement, and we're happy to say we were one of the founders of um, that framework, and um, the benefit of that was also that we could help, um, to some extent, inform um, mission measurement around some of the aspects that were important to us. And so, um, um, from day one on the the reengineering of the strategy, we implemented Impact Genome, um, and um, we walked through the process with many of our nonprofit partners uh, to ensure that they were um, going to be comfortable with how we were utilizing the framework and what we would be using it for. And there's, um, you know, there's also an aspect of sort of ensuring that um, as you think about measuring impact, you're using it in a constructive way to not only improve the impact that you as a corporation can have, but also the impact that the nonprofits that you're working on can also have. And that means working with them when, when you have the initial outcome to understand what, what the results are and to help them frame or shape how they can improve both their outcomes and their efficacy. I'm going to stop there and would be happy to entertain Great. questions around that. But Thank you, Arlene. You know, I think what you said is so important, really, with the, the collaboration with your nonprofit partners and having that those conversations right up front, and, and then obviously how that helped uh, inform your strategy because, uh, you know, there's the, the, the grantors and the grantees and and it's important that there's that symbiotic relationship that it works because obviously you're and we all with this benchmark are utilizing their data and information for us all to make better decisions. So I think that was um, really an important point that you were making. Nancy, you've been um, on this journey with us um, as well. And when we were having a conversation uh, last week, uh, Besides the work that you've done leading up to this point, I think it's also been interesting how you've been looking at that during this year with the pandemic and the uh, <clears throat> economic fallout as well as, um, you know, how that has uh, affected you know, basic safety nets um, out there. So would love to hear more about your journey on this and bringing it right to the present with uh, what you're doing around uh, safety nets as well. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. Uh, why don't I just address the uh, the COVID question and then see if uh, if the journey uh, seems to have relevance. Uh, we do um, do grant making to food providers and um, those who run shelters. And what we found during COVID, as everyone else found, was that there was much higher demand on the food providers. And so responding to what we saw initially as a 50% increase, we increased our giving by 50% of it to the food providers. But what we found as we engaged with them um, during the course of these many months was that their cost to feed was not necessarily in line with the number of people who were showing up. And to Jason's initial point, the benchmark allow you some frame of reference so that you know what questions to ask. So when it seemed that for some nonprofits, I see Arlene nodding her head, a lot of us have probably encountered the same thing, um, incurring additional costs, we began to ask the questions. And we found some really fascinating things, not answers, 
but more diagnostic pieces of data. So for example, although all of our food providers fall under the umbrella of Feeding America, they operated very differently. Some had supply chains that remain steady and constant throughout the pandemic, and others found themselves um, competing with small food chains, um, grocery chains, for their um, food supply. What, once we're able to kind of aggregate these data points and even just raise them to Feeding America, which we're in the process of doing, it allows them to determine what supply chain issues they might be able to offset before the next crisis, whether it's wildfires or floods or severe weather or another pandemic. So the value of having the benchmark against which to, you know, kind of grade and assess uh, the cost of your nonprofits, it just makes you ask smarter questions. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the supply chain issue because I think that's something that we might not necessarily think about on the surface, but especially when you are in more of a crisis situation, that has a really big impact on our nonprofits in order to provide the services that, that they need to, to do within their local communities. So, uh, yeah. Well, and Jeff, if I could just add in a, um, so, you know, supply chain is a yep. business resilience issue for everyone, not just for, sure. from our philanthropy, for our businesses. And um, another thing we determined in terms of the, you know, way above benchmark costs were the, um, the issues of reliance on volunteers for a lot of this work. And once the volunteers were no longer willing or able um, to participate in that distribution, they had to look for alternatives. I think this is going to really impact, and I'm just using the food providers as, a, as an example, it's really going to be able to impact our ability to help nonprofits with their business resilience moving forward so that we don't encounter exactly the same problems going into the next crisis. And, and having the benchmark really is what triggers asking these we questions. We have learned so much the last few months, I would say, because you are applying something that we normally think of with earthquakes and fires and hurricanes to obviously a situation that is ongoing, but in a way I think the volunteer piece is, is critical. I mean, I didn't realize that a large portion of volunteers at food banks were seniors, and seniors are more, are, you know, susceptible to the virus. So. There's all these interlocking pieces that, that tie into uh, what we do. So um, I so appreciate how you are bringing this work to present day and things that we um, are dealing with and frankly probably are going to be dealing with for a while knowing that uh, the economic uh, situation will probably be continuing with us and how this affects people and, and their livelihood. So Andrew, uh, Google.org, um, you know, you have been doing some pretty sophisticated uh, programs over the years that I think we've been impressed with. I was impressed that your position even exists. I mean, how many of us in corporate citizenship would love to have a, a department focused on impact <laughs> and measurement and all of that. Um, but tell us how your work with the Impact Genome Project has actually uh, helped you to look at, at your grant making um, possibly a different way than how you have in the past. Sure. Well, first, Jeff, thank you for having me. Thanks to the conference board for a conversation that's very timely, as we can already establish. Um, to take a step back, Google.org is Google's philanthropy. What we seek to do is to apply both money and employee time to solve big social problems through applications of technology and data. Um, we're a big global company, as you know, and we work in a lot of different issues and places, which means that we make a lot of different kinds of investments. I've been on the team for about six years, and I think looking back, I just took on this role about a year ago, looking back, we often could have a tendency to be a little bit fatalistic about our ability to understand the impact of our grants collectively, given all of the complexity and nuance and variety of them. And so when I took on this role, as you say, a new team, Impact and Insights, we call it, 
my charge was to figure out how do we push ourselves hard to really get a sense of the collective impact of our work and become much smarter about talking about it so that people can really learn from the impact that we're having. Um, so we sat down with Jason and we said, Jason, you know, let, help us think through this. I'll give you an example of some of the complexity that we've been able to distill through, through this partnership. One of our major uh, programs today is a program around the use of artificial intelligence for good, for social good. We conducted a big global challenge. We invited nonprofits to apply for funding and technical support to show us how they could use AI to address the biggest, world's biggest problems. Um, we landed on a dozen or so organizations doing many different things, ranging from the Trevor Project, which is using natural language processing to improve the way they triage inquiries from LGBT youth who are uh, perhaps experiencing thoughts of self-harm to groups who are doing early prediction of landslides. Now, how do you look at those two very different solutions and, and understand together the impact that the work that we, through our grants and technology support, are having with these organizations? What we landed on after a lot of thinking um, and, 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 and really pushing ourselves was every time we introduce AI, we're seeking to deliver on some kind of social impact metric more effectively and efficiently. So can we distill each of these to how the organization would have delivered on its mission before the use of AI and how it's delivering on it now? Uh, for a group like Trevor, you know, you've seen something like a 10x increase in the number of young people that it can serve through the introduction of AI tools than they were able to do with only human reviewers before. We can then layer on the benchmarks through the impact genome and say, how does this compare with best-in-class organizations, and it starts a conversation. I think that the important thing is with this is that it's not meant to be punitive or directive, but it is, it is directionally uh, useful in our conversations to understand how is the application of technology really helping to accomplish the impact that we seek. So that's the journey we've been on. We're still, I would say, just getting started in some sense, um, but, but you can imagine how much potential uh, there is there. A lot of potential. I think that was really good. Example, I mean, two very different types of organizations and outcomes uh, <clears throat> that you're thinking about and in, to the fact that you're using um, AI uh, in this work as well is amazing. So I think we'll probably have to have just another webcast talking about uh, AI and corporate citizenship. So appreciate that. You know, our, our, we mentioned uh, Larry Fink. We, you know, have been talking a lot about stakeholders lately, whether it, it be the BRT statement and looking at corporations' uh, roles in society, uh, community being one of the stakeholders, and community traditionally being kind of owned by the corporate citizenship, the corporate, uh, the community relations uh, folks. So. Um, you know, the whole stakeholder concept, I think, is, is really interesting. Uh, you know, Andrew, you can talk about your employees. Um, you know, Nancy, you talked about volunteers and, and how that plays into it. But at the same time, a lot of companies right now have not been able to uh, utilize uh, hands-on volunteers just because of the, uh, the pandemic. So we have a lot of, of different stakeholders. Um, you know, investors are certainly a big stakeholder that we talk um, about these days. Um, but also, when we talk about our communities, and, and we've talked a lot about the, the two-way street, how, how are you all thinking about giving greater voice to your stakeholders um, and how do you see the, the benchmark being able uh, to help have those deeper conversations? Anyone want to start? Arlene? So, Jeff, um, and, and I think that's an important point in the context of, of um, how um, sort of our world is evolving as it relates to um, an expectation that corporations will have a, uh, a more significant and a broader role in the context of society as a whole. But I think for us, the way we are uh, ensuring that there is a continuous sort of interaction between 
what we think is the right thing to do and how our stakeholders prioritize. And I think most um, corporations that sort of have an established corporate social responsibility practice have instituted this, but certainly, um, you know, our reporting and and sort of the the, the circular um, process of that is an important component of it, of which the impact genome um, outcomes are plays an important part to give it sort of credibility in the context of what we're saying we're doing um, publicly and our ability to really. Um, be able to message that in a credible way. So for us, um, we publish a CSR report every year, as I think many do. Um, but we are also now looking at uh, re a reevaluation of our strategies utilizing a materiality assessment framework. And so um, we, uh, and particularly in light of um, you know, how things are evolving, and specifically for us, because we're not only a, um, um, looking at this from sort of our own enterprise perspective, but also thinking about how we walk the walk and talk the talk from the standpoint of being a provider of ESG assessment. So everything has to really be consistent and meld together. And so this year, for 2020, we are instituting our materiality assessment, which will be intentionally focused on um, all of our stakeholders, including our investors, um, our customers, um, importantly, our employees, et cetera, to um, reassess if the priorities that we have articulated one, are the same priorities our stakeholders think are, are important. Um, and based on the, the analysis that we will do, then think about whether we need to either shift strategy or perhaps messaging, um, including sort of um, how, how credible we are in reporting our, our social impact. And I would say the impact genome outcomes are a key component of that. Um, we w recently went through a process um, of um, ensuring that the information in our CSR report is um, auditable and credible. And so uh, to the extent that um, we can move more consistently to um, frameworks that are standardized and comparable, not only about what we're doing, but what others are doing, um, I think that is a huge benefit in terms of being able to report out on the credibility of the things that we're doing. And, and when you look at your credibility, I think it's interesting how, how you said, you know, from what we learned, do we need to shift our strategy or do we need to shift our messaging? Because you know, to me, that's just such a key point because you might have the right strategy but the messaging isn't coming through the way you, you want to, or you are. The messaging is, is absolutely right on, but is not quite how the stakeholders are, are thinking about things. So um, I, I'm exactly. interested to learn more about how your materiality assessments uh, work, because I think materiality in in ESG overall, but specifically when you get into more of the corporate citizenship and philanthropy area, has been harder for us to get our arms around. Uh, so that right, and and the the one point I'd make on that, when and I think you know for those of us that are in this space, we understand this, but materiality, there's a difference between sort of financial materiality, which is from a financial statement perspective, and materiality to to stakeholders. Which um, and you know one of the experiences we recently had was um, the interconnection between reputational risk and what our stakeholders think is material. So I think that's the point that we um, you know need to ensure that we are informed about and understand what the potential consequences of that may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you look across the risk spectrum and how reputational risk fits into 
other aspects of sometimes reality versus <laughs> perception and have it all back together. So interesting. So Andrew and Nancy, um, any thoughts on the stakeholder piece? Yeah. Uh, happy to throw out one example of where our thinking here has evolved. Um, you know, for a company like ours, the, the communities where we live and work are such important stakeholders. I came to Google at a time when people were protesting our buses in the Bay Area, and it was a real, I think, call to us to think deeply about our commitment to the Bay Area and how we should be giving back. We have for many years been one of the largest corporate philanthropists in the Bay Area and in a number of other communities where we live and work, and I think that's important, so I don't want this example to diminish that. But as we sat down over the last few years with local government and nonprofit leaders, what we heard was money is great, please keep it up, where you can really add tremendous value is through your expertise in technology. You know, we have all so many smart engineers, data scientists, UX designers at Google. That goes so much further and lasting has a lasting impact than the money could ever have. And so we created a new program in our backyard communities, places like San Francisco, Seattle, Boulder, New York, where we've committed 50,000 uh, employee hours to uh, full-time pro bono support for tough technical challenges that cities are facing. For example, helping cities build um, front door benefit access programs that are just so much cleaner and, and easier to use for, for uh, citizens who want to get access to, to local government benefits. Helping the 911 system become more efficient. Uh, working on housing roles, lots of examples like this. So just wanted to throw that, that for us, again, communities are such an important stakeholder, and this is one way where we've really had to rethink sort of our traditional approach in consultation with them. I haven't yet had a chance to talk to Jason about how these, how we can benchmark some yeah. of our volunteer contributions, but it's definitely top of mind for me as we grow so that Andrew, program. I would love to join you in that conversation with Jason, because just as an example for, for us, <laughs> Um, in response to COVID, um, what we did do was, you know, certainly um, supported our nonprofit partners, but then um, across the board provided a number of free access to research and data analysis and pro bono support for nonprofits. And, um, you know, using some of the industry metrics um, put a valuation against that. And what we found was just through the first half of the year, the value of that sort of um, um, pro bono support, the contribution of products and services, was actually about three times what our um, grant making budget is. And so I would love to join you on that conversation with J Jason on how we can um, sort of systematize that. And not to pile on, but as Jason knows, like I'm always saying we need to tackle the volunteer and pro bono piece <laughs> of this. Um, because you're right, it's part of our core competency. See, I can just, um, can offer. I can just add a quick thought, which is that, I mean, the, the beautiful thing about, like, when you know what it costs to produce a unit of social change, you can fund that cost through cash, or you can fund that cost through offsetting the need for cash by giving people time or in-kind contributions, which translates to the same cost per outcome, right? Like if it's $1,000 to produce an outcome, if someone doesn't have to pay a program person to do something because a volunteer is doing that person, whether they're a mentor for someone for financial health or whether they're helping counsel somebody um, on, on a mental health, mental health issue um, or whether they're providing transportation or whatever, it's still the same delivery of value. And so whether it's cash or volunteering or in kind, the cost per outcome can be translated in the same um, way. Yeah. So Nancy, um, it looks like you're about ready to say something, but I also wanted to point to you when we talk about, you know, utilizing our core competencies and you gave us the, you know, important food, uh, you know, conversation um, because of the pandemic, but on an ongoing basis, I normally think of you in regards to uh, helping people to achieve financial wellness. So I don't know if you want to 
a little bit about how yeah. your core competencies, your stakeholders tie into financial wellness? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for teeing that up. And um, the conference board is going to have to invest in a large Zoom room, I think, because I, I'm at least one additional member of that of that meeting that, that's soon to be scheduled. Um, yes, we actually became involved with um, the Genome Project and Mission Measurements when we decided to go um, more deeply into financial wellness. We're a life insurance and retirement uh, company, and so that is a core competency for us. But candidly, we didn't know what kinds of programs or factors or interventions were successful for low-income individuals and communities and families, and whether or not they were aligned at all to what we find with our own customer base. And so um, the Genome uh, Project did a, a metadata analysis for us and came up with a number of factors that are predictive of long-term financial wellness, and those are what we're applying now um, as we do conduct due diligence and assess what is already in our portfolio. Uh, and I also want to um, echo something that Arlene said in terms of the credibility factor of using the benchmarking and the data. Um, we also produce, as, as most of us do, a CSR report. And although our greenhouse gas data is audited, uh, we have not had the report audited. And one of the steps to take is to make sure that all of these um, KPIs are something that can be tracked back. So I, I echo that, Arlene. I'd also just mention another stakeholder group, um, and that is the, the rating and ranking organizations and proxy advisor firms. So, you know, um, ISS, Institutional Shareholder Services, and the other large proxy advisor group, Glass-Lewis, um, both of them are very interested in financial services companies and insurance providers um, giving back to communities through things like financial wellness. So all of these stakeholder groups do inform the evolution of our strategies, um, and including what we use as KPIs, because if you report through the Dow Jones Sustainability Index uh, for inclusion, um, they do want to know how you measure the impact of what you're doing um, in these areas. And, you know, for, for our money, um, this has been a really wonderful uh, resource and a way of uh, telling our story and, and crafting our message yeah, along good. the line. Thank you for sharing that, um, <clears throat> Nancy, because I think the, the whole stakeholder piece and how you're looking at communicating uh, with each one is just becoming more uh, and more critical. Um, so, Andrew, you had mentioned the word protest at one point, and Arlene, I think I had heard you say early on, you mentioned walking the talk. Well, the, the last few months, obviously, we have seen lots of protests going on um, as a result of uh, racial injustices and structural racism. Um, and I think it, when we started out the year and we were getting into the pandemic, a lot of the things that we were measuring, whether I think, Nancy, to what you were talking about with, uh, you know, efficacy of, of programs around food security, uh, for instance, we had that already baked in. What I would love to hear from you all now are your thoughts on how do we measure the commitments, which most companies came out big, and this is where we're talking about walking the talk, and now companies are putting together programs around racism and around equity. How do we measure those, you know, and benchmark those? Do we do it? with the same tools that we have, or are there enhancements coming down the road? You know, Jason, why don't I turn to you first, and we'll see what the rest of the group says. Well, um, the system of thinking that's emerging in philanthropy and also in government, um, and I serve on the, um, the executive director also of the Center for Impact Sciences at the University of Chicago, and what we're trying to do is really make this work more scientific, right? So there's a system of thinking as opposed to just let's do good. The system of thinking is we want to produce an outcome 
for a particular type of beneficiary, and we want to figure out what works to produce that outcome. Um, in this conversation, we've been talking about the outcomes and what it cost, um, and we've been talking about some of the stakeholders. But in this case, we're talking about a beneficiary class that has been massively underserved, and we're also talking about a new class of outcomes that hasn't really emerged. In fact, it's not on the price of impact index right now because it's not a commonly funded outcome like STEM or like job creation or like getting kids into college. And so I think what you're seeing is the emergence of a new class of outcomes. And um, that's driven by a set of beneficiaries that have been historically and presently um, underrepresented and under um, underdelivered to. So I think from an analytical or scientific perspective, we're talking about um, recognizing outcomes that have been sort of um, not made explicit before. And that's why um, it's both a challenge and I think a big focus of philanthropy to say, all right, hey, let's focus on these outcomes. Let's figure out how to deliver them. Yeah, and that's why we call this a journey. So our, our way, we talked a little bit about this on, yeah. on Friday. Yeah. So what, what I'd say, and, and um, just a following on from Jason's um, um, comments around um, there being an opportunity to potentially refine the, the sort of um, measurement mechanism, um, very early on in our interaction with mission measurement, because, you know, I mentioned our three pillars, but the other aspect of it is we are very definitive that we prioritize women and those from underserved communities, which typically means um, in most places in the world, um, you know, disadvantaged ethnicities. And so we had pressed um, mission measurement around providing some cut of the data on um, by ethnicity and not just gender. Um, and I think, you know, we, we got to sort of a reasonable place um, before 2020 sort of unfolded. The other thing I would say is, um, you know, we made a decision that given everything that was unfolding in 2020, first with the pandemic and then with the economic downturn and then looking at the impact of that on um, small businesses and education, et cetera, um, and then you had, you know, the highlighting of the racial injustices in the United States, which were really kind of amplified around the world. But we made a decision that we, what we, the way we would respond to that was instead of shifting strategy or where we in, invested um, socially, we would double down on our pillars and be specific around addressing um, it, issues that were emerging because of all of this disruption in 2020. So for instance, in, in, small and grow, in the area of small and growing businesses, we decided that we would increase our funding to those organizations that supported small and growing businesses, and then would also utilize and encourage that influence to specifically address black businesses. Um, and so, you know, we have not departed from our CSR pillars. In fact, we're kind of doubling down, but being more intentional about um, specific cohorts within those pillars that we want to address. And so we're doing that for small and growing businesses. We're, we have uh, um, um, an, a subsidiary called 427. They're doing a lot of work on the environmental impact um, and the, and the, uh, around and what that means for racial inequity. We're also targeting um, more uh, students from um, underrepresented groups, so asking our nonprofits to be specifically focused on those individuals that are of brown and, and, and black um, um, ethnicities in the context of their programming. Thank you. So doubling down, being more intentional, and in looking at that. So, okay, good, good insights. Andrew, Nancy, anything you want to add to that? I, I'm happy to jump in, um, and I'll leave plenty of time, Andrew. Uh, uh, like Arlene, um, 
and Moody's, we are doubling down on our pillars as well. So um, working with um, existing partners, specifically uh, the Urban League um, in a lot of our cities, um, working with um, uh, professional grant-making organizations that can help us put um, a diversity lens um, on our grant making to help inform it. Um, and we are specifically looking at um, black-led nonprofit organizations. Uh, we have not yet engaged with the, the Robin Hood Foundation, but they have a huge initiative now to identify and support black-led organizations um, and possibly help with things like infrastructure and fundraising and other things that could help um, a larger, more sophisticated, uh, you know, long-term or long-term organization um, teamed with um, a younger community organization that could use that sort of help. So those are some of the initiatives that we're looking toward in, um, in 2021. Andrew, any thoughts on this? Yeah, for, on our end, um, plus one to everything that both Nancy and Arlene said, we are doing that. We we have for a few years um, been funding racial justice work directly, and we doubled down on that in 2020 with a $12 million commitment. A portion of that work is directed toward criminal justice reform, and a portion of that more toward the matter, uh, the, the movement directly. So, for instance, um, funding groups like EJI, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. Uh, and that is, as Jason said, incredibly hard stuff to, to measure because you're dealing with issues of, of advocacy and narrative change that it just don't distill quite as cleanly to things like, did someone get a job? Um, I did want to echo one point that Nancy made at the end, which is uh, something we've been putting greater attention on in the last year, and I think really encouraged by work that came out of Bridgespan and Ford and others, is to look more closely at how the groups that we're funding represent those that they serve and not only at the CEO level, but also the board level, um, and for us, technical leadership. I think that's an area where you see perhaps the least diversity in a lot of organizations that we fund. So looking at CTO roles and understanding, are we moving the needle on greater representation among the, the many nonprofit groups that we make Good. grants to? All right, thank you. Um, I know we're running out of, of time. I know we could go longer. Uh, thinking each might, one of you might have a, a parting thought or a comment uh, for the group. Um, why don't we start with you, Nancy, and then we'll end with Jason. So, Nancy. Um, I, I will um, remember something that, that one of us uh, commented on earlier, and that is the impact uh, on the nonprofit side of things. What we have found working for the last two years now with um, the impact genome and these measures is that the nonprofits have really embraced them. Um, it's a little daunting at the beginning. It's a little intimidating. There's a concern about whether or not you're going to be judged on a curve. Um, but the ability to explain your impact when you are doing fundraising has been significant. And we see a, a really high uptick in adoption level lately. So we're really optimistic with the is going. Andrew. You know, I'm not sure I have much else to add. I want to thank you for letting us be a part of this important conversation. This has been a, a year for all of us, and in some ways both the most challenging year of my career and in other ways the best because it's been a real opportunity for those of us in this in these kinds of roles to really step up and think about the impact we can have as companies. So I'm yeah, glad we were able so, to highlight some of that today. So true. Challenging, but silver linings at the same time. Arlene. Um, just um, following on with what Andrew and Nancy said, um, you know, I, I do think we work in a space where we are going to be required to be continue to be more innovative and nimble around the things that we do and what we consider and, you know, really extend this in a way that uh, we can talk credibly and authentically about the good that we're doing in the world, but also what the benefits to our respective organizations and all its stakeholders. Yep, absolutely. Jason, bring us home. <laughs> well, I'll just add that, first of all, um, innovation is a product of, of a lot of um, a lot of partners working together to figure out how to solve a problem and all the people on this call and many of the people listening have been part of this journey um, and 
and it's definitely the journey. What I will say is the big learning I've had through all this is that uh, data can be good and data can be bad. And I think so often we talk about data because there's a lot of smart guys out there and gals creating data and being data scientists. But data can really be a huge burden on nonprofits. It can be a tremendous burden on um, companies. It's also a big burden on uh, the public who have no idea what to make out of all this. So thinking about moving from data to actually something more useful, um, like how do we create applied data? How do we push ourselves to create things like benchmarks? And then how do we push ourselves to figure out how to use benchmarks in ways that are constructive, not destructive? How do we realize that now um, we can empower nonprofits to tell their story instead of hiring consultants and making up logic models, they have a, a standard language they can use to tell their story. Instead of hiring economists to do a random control trial to prove that their program had um, a certain impact on society, they can use benchmarks to refer to the true cost of what it takes to produce these results. So I think starting to mature our use of data and ask questions that are more incisive and constructive is where we need to take the field. So I really appreciate your leadership, Jeff, and the conference board for convening this conversation along those lines. Well, you're welcome, and thank you. As, as we said from the outset, it's a journey. It's been great being on the journey with the four of you today. Um, we still have things that we're working on figuring out uh, at the conference board. Uh, we are going to have uh, some new resources and tools for you that we'll be rolling out over the next month, including our next edition of our report uh, around this work. So keep an eye out uh, for that. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, the conference board has a wealth of resources that we touched upon during today's program. As a reminder, you can download the slide deck in the download section at the bottom of your screen. On October 3rd and 4th, please join us for the Corporate Citizenship and Philanthropy Forum. This event is free to all conference board members. And for non-members, if you use the code KN1, you'll receive a $100 discount at checkout. If you've enjoyed today's discussion, I encourage you to subscribe to our Corporate Citizenship and Philanthropy blog and newsletter by hitting the subscription link at the bottom of the presentation. So thanks for joining us today, and thank you to our fantastic panels. Um, please don't forget to complete the evaluation so we can incorporate your feedback into future webcasts. Thanks again. Stay well. Bye.